What's going on ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another video. Now in today's video we'll be covering task 4 and task 6, the lecture based integrated speaking questions. So take out your notebooks, grab your writing utensils and get ready to take some outstanding notes. That's the reading passage we'll be covering today. That's the task 4 reading passage. So the topic is explicit memories and implicit memories. Now I foresee that Getting the definition for this topic is going to be a little bit more difficult than other reading passages or task four topics because there are two different concepts, okay? But let's focus on getting each definition, all right? Okay, so let's look for explicit memories first. That's given to us in the second line. An explicit memory is a conscious or intentional recollection of facts, names, blah, blah, blah. So the definition for explicit memories is are, don't forget to make sure that your subject and the verb agree with each other, okay? Which are conscious or intentional recollections. So that's the first part of the definition. Let's look for the meaning of implicit memories now. So let's look for the word implicit. There it is in the uh, fourth line. Memories of this kind, this kind are called implicit memories. So what are they? Another kind of memory that is not conscious. So, and unconscious memories. So that's the definition for implicit and this is the definition for explicit. So let's say the whole thing as the ending sentence. To sum up, these were two perfect examples of explicit memories and implicit memories, which are conscious or intentional recollections and unconscious memories. So once you're done saying this part and the, the listener is going to immediately understand that, okay, so this is the definition for implicit memories. So guys, this reading passage was a little bit more difficult and confusing because the topic itself has two concepts. But don't fear. Don't be too intimidated. All you have to do is figure out what the definition for one and the other are. Okay? All right. Now let's listen to the lecture. Okay. Uh, the first kind of memory, we're all very familiar with this, right? You probably remember what you had for dinner last night you have a conscious memory of last night's dinner. So um, if I ask you, what did you eat last night, you could tell me. But these other kind of memories, implicit memories, they work differently. Let's take an example from the world of advertising. When you're driving along a highway, you see plenty of billboards, you know, roadside advertisements. You certainly don't remember them all but they still affect you. Marketing researchers have shown, well, to be specific, let's say there's a billboard on the highway advertising a car called the Panther. The ad shows a big picture of the car, and above the car in huge letters is the name of the car, Panther. A lot of people drive by the billboard. But ask those drivers later if they saw any advertisements for cars and, well, they'll think about it and a lot of them will say no. They honestly don't remember seeing any. They have no conscious memory of the Panther billboard. So you ask these same people a different question. You ask, um, okay, uh, you ask them to name an animal starting with the letter P. What do you think they'll answer? Do they say pig? Pig is the most common animal that starts with the letter P. But they don't say pig. They say panther. The billboard had an effect even though the drivers don't remember ever seeing it. All right, all right. Now, the professor actually gave us two examples because the first example it was very, very brief. But the first example was about the dinner that you had the night before. And that was an illustration of explicit memories, conscious memories, okay? And the second example was about the billboard or billboards in general, okay? All right, so the beginning sentence is that and the ending sentence is that. No matter how confusing or difficult the lecture's information was, you should be able to say the beginning and ending sentences without making any mistakes, okay? So in other words, your first and last impressions should be perfect or flawless even before you start touching these sentences over here. Okay, so let's look at the details. Now I'm going to start by saying, to begin with, 
Most people remember what they had for dinner last night. So, these people have a conscious memory. However, implicit memories work differently. For example, when driving, people see many billboards that have an effect on them. To be specific, there was a billboard for a car called Panther, and lots of people drove by it. These individuals did not remember seeing the billboard, but when they were asked to name an animal starting with P, they all said Panther, simply because this billboard had an effect on them. That's what I'm going to say. So you don't have to keep mentioning how these people didn't remember the billboard, okay? And that's exactly why the professor kind of kept beating around the bush instead of getting to the point, because he was mentioning something that was already explained to us over and over again. And that's why I didn't have to really follow along with what the professor said too quickly or in a rush, okay? All right, now that we know what I'm gonna say, let's listen to my sample response. In the lecture, the professor elaborated on a couple of different examples to explain the concept of explicit memories and implicit memories. To begin with, most people remember what they had for dinner last night, so they have a conscious memory. However, implicit memories work very differently. For example, when driving, people see many billboards that have an effect on them. To be specific, there was a billboard for a car called the Panther, and lots of people drove by this billboard. These individuals did not remember seeing the billboard, but when they were asked to name an animal starting with P, they all said panther, simply due to the fact that this billboard still had an effect on them. To sum up, these were two perfect examples of explicit memories and implicit memories given by the professor in the lecture. Thank you for your time and consideration. All right, now I definitely did not have to say thank you for your time and consideration here because as you can see, I don't know if you can actually see it, but I have 0.234 milliseconds left. So that's pushing the envelope. As I've said in my previous videos, if you only have about two, three, or maybe even four seconds left, you don't have to say thank you for your time and consideration, okay? But since I said it for this task four question, I'm gonna try my best to not have to use that sentence, thank you for your time and consideration, for task five, okay? All right. So, for this sample response, since I had a ton of things to say, I didn't have enough time for the definition, which is actually very fortunate, because let's be honest here for a brief moment. If I wasn't here to guide you along the reading passage so that we have a definition organized, how many of you guys think you would have had a definition like this written on your piece of paper? Be honest. Now, that's not the end of the world. It's perfectly fine to not have a definition prepared even after the 45 seconds of reading expires. Because, as you just saw, for a response like this, I didn't have enough time for the definition at the end anyways, okay? So this is another tip. If you don't have a definition organized, start a little bit later, start like two or three seconds after the beep, so that you naturally only have about 10 seconds left once you're done organizing the lecture's information. All right, okay, now let's move over to task six. One of the hardest parts of teaching is keeping your students' attention. Now, the key to doing this is understanding the concept of attention. Basically, there are two types of attention. The first type is active. Active attention is voluntary. It's when you intentionally make yourself focus on something. And since it requires effort, it's hard to keep up for a long time. Okay, so um, let's say you're teaching a, a biology class, and today's topic is frogs. All right, you're standing at the front of the room and lecturing. A frog is a type of animal known as an amphibian. Well, this isn't necessarily going to keep the student's interest, but most of them will force themselves to pay active attention to your lecture but it's only a matter of time before they get distracted. Now the other type of attention is passive attention, when it's involuntary. 
Passive attention requires no effort because it happens naturally. If something's really interesting, students don't have to force themselves to pay attention to it. They do it without even thinking about it. So back to our biology lecture. You start talking about frogs, and then you pull a live frog out of your briefcase. You're describing it while you hold it up. Show the students how long its legs are and, and how they're used for jumping, for example. Then maybe you even let the frog jump around a bit on the desk or the floor. In this case, by doing something unexpected, something more engaging, you can tap into their passive attention. And it can last much longer than active attention. As long as the frog's still there, your students will be interested. All right, all right. Now, we once again got very, very lucky with this Task 6 lecture, and that's because there's a topic, two types of attention. So for this response, we're able to say exactly work for the beginning and ending sentences. That's exactly why we are so lucky. Organizing the beginning and ending sentences for this response is very, very simple. Okay, now, over here, when we're moving over to passive attention, this time I think it would be better to say on the other hand instead of furthermore, okay? All right, now, the first section was about active attention. So to begin with, active attention is voluntary and thus hard to keep up for a long time. For instance, in biology class, if the professor only lectures, the students will not be interested. In other words, they will have to force themselves to pay attention. Now, in this example, when the professor was lecturing, he or she wanted you to pretend, you to imagine being the teacher, the biology teacher. But we're going to change that to a professor actually teaching the class so it becomes much easier for us to organize, okay? So we don't have to say, for instance, if I were teaching a biology class, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to say it like that. Okay, so let's move on. On the other hand, passive attention is involuntary and requires no effort. To be more specific, if the professor pulls a live frog out of his briefcase, just choose the gender of the professor, stick with it, out of his briefcase, the class will become much more engaging. Needless to say, the students will be interested and pay attention more easily. So the professor didn't say this, but I feel like adding it because it's all about paying attention. All right. Now that we know what I'm going to say, let's listen to my sample response. The professor gave a lecture about how two types of attention exactly work. To begin with, active attention is voluntary and thus very hard to keep up for a long time. For instance, in biology class, if the professor only lectures, the students will not be interested. In other words, they will have to force themselves to pay attention. On the other hand, passive attention is involuntary and requires no effort. To be more specific, if the same professor pulls a live frog out of his briefcase, the biology class will become much more engaging. Needless to say, the students will be very interested and pay attention really easily. In summation, this was how two types of attention exactly work which was illustrated by active and passive attention. All right, so I guess everything worked out. For task four, in that response, I was pushing the envelope and said, given by the professor in the lecture, plus thank you for your time and consideration. But thankfully for this response, I didn't have to add those two extra statements in the end. So everything worked out. Um, this isn't something that you need to do, it's not something that's necessary or essential, but it would be better to keep track of the sentences that you used in your previous responses so that you don't sound so redundant or repetitive. Alright, alright, that just about wraps up today's video. If you enjoyed the sample responses, leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel if you still have not done so, Share my content with your close friends and family members if they need the extra assistance. And if you are a self-disciplined and dedicated individual, reach out to me about my tutoring services. Let's get the score that you deserve and need. The next video will be covering TOEFL integrated writing. So if those essay prompts are giving you a lot of challenges, be sure to stay tuned and to check out the next video. Peace.